Welcome back to Rise. Artist Philip Burke is here with us in the studio. While his face might not be recognizable to you, we're sure that his work certainly will be. Philip is a world renowned artist whose work has appeared in countless magazines, newspapers, and art galleries all over the world. His exclusive contract with Vanity Fair made it possible for Philip to come home to Buffalo, where he lives and works today. And his drawings and illustrations have appeared in Time, Newsweek, Sports Illustrated, The New York Times, and probably best known for Rolling Stone magazine. He was recognized by the Living Legacy Project at the Birchfield Penny Art Center in 2013, and we're thrilled to have Philip here today. Philip, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. Yes. That's great. So, I mean, take us back. How, how and when and where were you when you found out about this incredible talent? Well, I started really seriously becoming interested in cartooning in high school. And at first it was political cartooning. And I think when I was a sophomore in high school, I was introduced to the work of David Levine, who is considered to be the father of modern day caricature. And you may know his work, cross-hatching of caricatures. And once I saw his work, it, was, it became something I couldn't not do. And so I got very serious at the age of 15, and I started doing work that was noticed as professional. And even the, I remember, I think it was the news did an article on me at that time. So is this without professional or any type of formal training? Right. It was just looking at the work of David Levine and trying to do work that looked like it. And I remember when I had that article done, the old uh, editor for the news, Murray Light, told me at the time, you could make a good living at this. And from that point on, even though I tried to do other things in terms of studies or academics, in the back of my head it was always... Well, it doesn't really matter because I know I just want to do caricature. And what age was this? You knew this was 15. 15 years old. Yeah. So what was the transition from uh, you decided to stay close and you went to Toronto University? Yes. Actually, the reason I went to Toronto because it was a way to live away from home very cheaply. Oh. There was this, like this period of time where as an American, you could go to the St. Michael's College for the amount that it would cost a Canadian. I don't know how that worked, but it was for me kind of a way to be on my own without the responsibility of truly being on my own. Right. I went with the idea of going for academics, art history, English, but I took more interest in doing caricatures. So what the... led you to New York City? Well, New York City is where every artist had to go back then. So this was, I went to New York in 77, but back then you couldn't even get into the field of caricature or editorial illustration without being in New York. Is that where you were introduced to Vanity Fair? Yes, actually. But it started. It all started with me going to New York. I think I had like $100 in my pocket. I really didn't know anybody. It was a different time and a, diff, you know, a different place. But back then you could go into a magazine shop, look at magazines, look at the art director, call them up and get an appointment the next day. So I just uh, took my work all around and left-leaning publications started to use me right away. And actually, I got work right away from New York Times, Time Magazine, just as somebody who was doing caricature that was fresh. But it was a village voice that kept me going back in the early days. So what is the process from start to finish when you get commissioned for a job, say with uh, Vanity Fair? The, the first thing is trying to find out everything I can about the person that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And usually when I did work for Vanity Fair, it would be political. So at that time that I was doing a lot of work for Vanity Fair, I was kind of a political junkie too. I was always checking out what was happening politically. So, And then trying to find pictures. Usually publications will supply me with some photos, but back then it was a little trickier trying to get photos. Now, nowadays, you know, now what happens is once I get an assignment, I'll go to Google and I'll go to YouTube, and I'm able to get so much reference. So how do you decide? I'm not an artist, but look, I can look at any one of your photos and immediately identify who that person is. It's, it's a caricature with a twist. I mean, how do you decide, you know, um, the, neck, the neck width or the neck length and the twist and the... The 3D dimensions. Well, that's a great question. I'm going to try to answer that. Actually, I my goal is always to try to get the inside by picturing the outside. And I learned early on that if I'm true to what I'm looking at, even if I'm stretching it, the inside comes out. But actually, it's not a particular feature I'm focused on. I'm 
basically I'm caricaturing or trying to bring out the personality through all the features. And it is a pretty intense process. It starts with very, very, very straight drawings. And I'll do each profile, I'll do each three quarter, and these drawings could take an hour, two, three hours. You made Joe, uh, The Rise, that's one of our favorites, your work, when you did Joe Macy. It's in one of my favorites. But you made him look balanced and normal, as opposed to Garcia, Jerry Garcia, that, that two-dimensional yes. face. Interesting. Well, for example, with the Jerry Garcia, you almost can't do him without getting some kind of reference to tripping. So that was kind of my oh, peering into that. Actually, when I look at the Jerry Garcia painting, it all happens in the moment. It all happens spontaneously. But looking at it after it was done, definitely I felt like I was successful in capturing kind of the bizarre quality and also the two different sides. Well, we love your work. Yeah. Now, most people don't know that you were born and raised in Tonawanda and that you've just somehow, you're an international artist. I, I'm sure you travel a lot, but how have you balanced work and family? Tell us about your family. Well, let's see. Now, you mentioned why. Yeah. Um, after being in New York, I went to New York when I was 21, and after being there for almost six years, getting myself started, mm -hmm. simultaneous with getting an exclusive contract with Vanity Fair, I met a woman on a trip back home who I it was love at first sight and also she was pioneering a movement of practice of true Buddhism and I fell in love with both right away and um, I waited for nine months in New York for her to come and she wouldn't and so I it was a combination of things but I just realized you know what's more important where I am or who I'm with and so I came back here and never regretted it. So what, as far as practicing Buddhism, do you travel a lot? Do you, are you really deeply into the practice? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Um, actually, after being in New York for six years and realizing that my caricatures were never going to change the world politically or any other way, when I met this Buddhism, it really became a true purpose. I mean, I, I was living in New York during the punk days, during the Reagan era. I had pretty much given up for several reasons, given up hope in a lot of ways in my life. But when I met this Buddhism and saw how I would be able to change my life and have a good positive influence on the people around me, it became more the driving force, whereas before everything was art. Now the art, in a sense, served. So it's like a balance between the two. Does it change the way you've done art now? Absolutely. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, when I look back over the years of my work, I saw the first change was that I stopped being so critical. And then I started to see that my work, in my work I could see I was portraying different sides of people instead of, you know, one-sided. But as time went on, I hope that my work reflects humanity in the sense that when you look at someone that I've done, when you look at the painting, you see the distortion sometimes and the wild colors, but my goal is that you also see some of yourself and that the paintings reflect the person's humanity. And you, do. you still must be spending some time in New York. I mean, Rolling Stone, Time, Vogue. I mean, you got to be going back and forth quite a bit. No, actually, for this kind of business, you really don't have no. to. And I was one of the first artists to leave that far from New York back in the 80s and start sending sketches by fax and then started sending packaging my paintings. But very quickly it became a kind of thing where the, if your work was something they wanted, they come after it. But I do go to New York. Who, have, who haven't you done? I mean, you've done almost everybody. Who haven't you done? really wanted? <laughs> it's a great list. Um, yeah, it's hard to find somebody that I haven't done. Um, or Matt, or what funny story am I you have? Uh, <laughs> How about what's next? What's Any new portraits you're painting? Um, right now I'm working on a portrait of Kate Middleton. Mm -hmm. And that is more of a portrait. And actually, the painting that I did of you, Joe, was more of a portrait. Right. So usually that's determined by who I'm doing, how wild and, and far out I get. Um, but you mentioned something about a story about meeting something, somebody that I painted. Yeah. The one that stands out the most is when I painted Andy Warhol. And that was just an incredible experience for me. Well, we that's had to be strange. I mean, it, had to be it was strange. <laughs> it was strange. Um, he was strange for sure, but he was very generous with his time and with his spirit. I had met him 
just because I was looking out my apartment window in the West Village and I saw the hair and I recognized who it was and I ran outside. Um, this was, I was early 20s back or mid 20s back then. I was just in everybody's face, didn't matter who it was, if I wanted something. And I just went up to him and said, my name's Philip Burke, I'd like to paint you. And I was shocked because I figured he wouldn't know who I am. So did Andy Warhol actually sit for you? Yes, he did. He invited me to come to the factory anytime. It took me a year to get up the courage to do it. And I was a nervous wreck. But he sat for about four and a half hours. Luckily, my wife was with me talking to him the whole time. And when I finished the painting, he looked at it and said, oh, looks just like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Philip, listen, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, my you. pleasure. It's wonderful to be here. We will be back with more Rise.